Okay. Um, so Neil just talked about the importance of targets, checklists, uh, monitoring, evaluation, and development um, uh, regulations and plans. So this presentation is a good follow-up. It's an example of a community that has taken this idea of checklist targets, evaluation and monitoring, and putting um, those concepts into practice to a next level and, and in a very, um, I would say, comprehensive way. And that's Peel region in um, Ontario. So just to give you a sense of where Peel region is, it's located uh, north, uh, northwest of the center of the world. <laughs> Toronto, and <laughs> I feel I can say that because I don't live in Toronto, um, and uh, it, has, it, does, um, it is uh, undergoing really rapid growth. Uh, Peel region welcomes over 20,000 new residents every year. It's a huge amount of people. Um, the, the growth is quite uneven throughout the region, so you will see Caledon at the very top, a bit more of a rural community with a lot slower growth than, say, Mississauga or Brampton. Unique challenges. In, in Caledon, it's really about preserving that rural character, uh, thinking about what do we do with our green fields? Can we prevent things like leapfrogging and encroaching on our agricultural lands? Um, in Mississauga, it's really a lot about uh, how to remediate brownfields, old, abandoned industrial sites that are toxic. How do we turn them into new recreation areas, new town centers, vibrant communities? And how do we um, beautify and densify our existing, um, I guess, suburban inner city neighborhoods? Peel region is very auto-dependent. Uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit like a suburbia on steroids. Huge streets, um, very much uh, car-oriented. Um, big increase in single um, occupant vehicle trips, and a huge increase in physical and activity levels, and as well diabetes, levels of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which is what really prompted uh, the medical health officer in Peel region to make this work, creating um, healthy community environments a top priority, just looking at the kind of trends that the community was facing in terms of diabetes. So what was the purpose of the Peel Health Background Studies Framework Project? It was all about developing, uh, I guess, a process and tools to ensure that new developments in the community are promoting acti active, healthy lifestyles. So looking at when a developer comes to the municipality and says, I would like to propose a new subdivision, for example, a new residential subdivision, providing a process for evaluating the health impacts of the proposed development. And so providing a sort of a process for developers as well as for municipalities to assess what's being proposed through a health lens. So what steps went into developing this health background studies framework, which is really a health impact assessment uh, process? Um, five steps went into it. Uh, number one was to do a situational assessment. Number two, developing terms of reference. Number three, developing a user guide for uh, planners as well as developers. Uh, number four, evaluating all of these draft documents that I just mentioned, uh, inviting stakeholders at the table to provide feedback, uh, looking at are, are the documents clear, are they feasible, are they realistic, uh, and then refining everything based on feedback, and finally developing an implementation strategy. As was mentioned earlier, it's, one thing is to have all the documents and, and all the policies in place, but the next step is to put them into action and make sure what some paper translates on the ground. So I'm just going to skim through in detail uh, over those five steps I just mentioned. Number one was to do a situational assessment. So what Peel Region really did was to uh, give a detailed look at what was the policy context at a provincial level. In other words, uh, provincial policies Existing provincial policies, um, would they facilitate or impede implementation, implementation of a health impact assessment uh, within the development application process? Um, same deal in terms of local policies, so looking at existing regional and municipal policies and how they would align or not with um, this idea of integrating health impact assessments to development. 
proposals. Um, the idea really is to not look at the policy or the tool in a vacuum, but to think about it within a context and, and looking at all the different policy levels to make sure everything is supporting of creating this healthier set of developments. Um, the next step as well was to really look at what other communities have done. And we've gotten some examples today. They were absolutely fantastic. But really looking at which, what communities, uh, which communities in North America have done a health impact assessment or checklist and have to implement them and what have they learned. So really try not to start from scratch but build on what was done in the past. Uh, one example is um, San Francisco has a pretty thorough uh, health impact assessment checklist. So that was one example of the tools that we discovered and, and build on to develop the tool for Peel. Uh, finally, it was very important to bring to the table all of the different stakeholders from the very beginning. So having the courage to ask developers, how would you feel about being required to submit an additional level of studies? Uh, what would make it feasible for you versus not? How, how can we make it work without alienating uh, you? Uh, as well as talking to planners, making sure this provides support for their work and existing planning goals versus impede uh, and provide a barrier or an, an additional level of unusual, um, useless, if you want, work. Um, and also talking to health stakeholders, NGOs, community groups. Uh, lastly, uh, it was important to really look at what other studies developers are required to provide. So when you're a developer and you go to the municipality with your great project idea for, say, a new subdivision, uh, you will be required a number of studies already, economic impacts, uh, environmental impacts, traffic impacts, um, aesthetics and human scale, shade and sunshine and sunlight, you name it. So we wanted to look at what other requirements and see which ones of those existing studies included provisions for health impacts. Because we didn't want to ask for information in a redundant way. We wanted to be really uh, conscious of what already was on the developer's plate. Um, the next step after having done this pretty thorough assessment was to develop terms of reference. So what terms of reference are is simply a methodology, a checklist, if you want. What exactly are we going to be asking developers to assess and how? And provide a level playing field for all developers, letting them know in advance what will be ask, asked of them and what we're looking for. Um, so it's a standardized method. Um, it's evidence-based. It's a checklist. What it isn't, and that's very important, it is not something to be used alone in isolation to either reject or approve development applications. It is rather to be used uh, as an informative tool as part of a broader, more holistic process that also takes into account economics, environmental, social, and other impacts. So more about those terms of reference. Uh, the terms of reference are based on six core elements. You can see them listed here. We have density, service proximity, land use mix, street connectivity, streetscape characteristics, and parking. Um, those elements were selected because the literature shows that those built environment elements are the most influential of physical activity levels. So there is clear literature showing that when you tweak density, you are, in fact, impacting people's levels of physical activity, same with things like parking or land use mix. So based on those six core elements, uh, for each of them, we developed a rationale, a health rationale. How does this impact health? Why is this important? Objectives, for example, coming up with density thresholds that favor walking, access to transit, connectivity. Um, and then putting on paper some key standards, actual numbers, what are potentially minimum required requirements or thresholds to achieve health benefits for each of these core elements? Some key questions that we would suggest developers consider when looking at all of these aspects of their proposed development. And finally, reporting requirements, so that when you get reports as a municipalities or studies, they're quite consistent. There is a common table of content or outline. Quick skimming, uh, a quick skim through the terms of reference. Uh, as I mentioned, rationale, objective, minimum standards. So you can see here, for example, density, um, when you're looking at infill or 
inner city uh, suburbs and, and urban centers, a minimum density of 200 people per, and jobs per hectare. Key questions. Uh, you can see here the key questions are key questions are really asking the developers and the planners to think about the proposed development and the element they were looking at in the context of the community. As was mentioned earlier, it's not a cookie cutter approach. You need to be very community specific and very individual. So keeping into account other elements. And finally, the, record, the reporting requirements. Evaluation, so as I mentioned, uh, once the draft terms of reference were produced, we got all the stakeholders again at the table to provide us feedback. Is this clear? Is this feasible? And we even tested it on three, um, I guess, uh, hypothetical developments in uh, Toronto and Peel region. We finally refined them based on feedback, and we developed a very, very, uh, I would say, comprehensive and pretty nice from a design perspective, a user guide. So you can see for each of the elements, we're detailing what is this, why does it matter from a health point of view, what does this look like, what does health-friendly density look like, health-promoting density look like, with including examples of existing models and uh, promising practices around North America. Finally, we provided an objective. So for example, in this case, we would like to promote density uh, that promotes walking and access to transit. And the minimum standards, those are all based on research and the literature. Um, some resources, as well as to go one level, one level down, again, uh, looking at those minimum requirements at different, in different contexts, whether you're doing infill, greenfield, or both infill and greenfield development. I should mention that greenfield is a as you probably know, a double-edged sword. Um, if you really have to do greenfield, it's better to do it right uh, than to do it wrong, but it, it can lead to leapfrogging and to building of communities that at the micro scale are super walkable, but they're in far-flung locations and really not that walkable because people have to drive and commute two hours every day to get to. So you have to really be careful about greenfield development. The user guide includes a matrix for planners that outlines at what levels of the planning and development application process each of the elements and standards can be influenced. The key questions I mentioned before for developers to consider the reporting requirements. So that was it for the guide. Um, in terms of implementation, three key recommendations that came out of stakeholder consultations. Uh, one, to establish a supportive policy framework. So Peel Region has been actively working with policymakers at various levels to ensure that policies at the provincial, regional, and municipal levels support application of a health impact assessment. Uh, do not impede the development approval process. Uh, in the end, developers do bring money to our communities, jobs, create jobs, housing. So we don't want to alienate and interfere in a negative way. We want to be conscious and think about how we can integrate that in a smooth way. Leading by example, um, the first few steps, the, the first um, dry out of this um, study uh, framework will be really about rewarding those developers that are doing the right thing and, and getting them out there, getting them to be proud of what they're doing and market their developments as being health friendly. And some priority action items, which you can check out uh, on, in the report. Finally, before I conclude, I just gave a really heavy presentation full of policy talk and kind of abstract, but it's really all about doing this work. It's really about the people in our communities, and, and I wanted to bring us back to that. It's really about improving people's lives, and in some cases, even saving lives, because it's about preventing people from getting chronic diseases. Um, so I just wanted to bring us back to that and, and also mention Newfoundland actually has a unique opportunity because of the large amount of growth you're experiencing to do it right. Where, where communities are growing and developing, you have an opportunity to do it right from the get-go as opposed to having to go back years later and retrofit it or fix it, which actually can be very expensive and very difficult to do. So I'm very excited to be here today because I think this province has an opportunity to help us create a new narrative for Canada, one where we do things right in the first place versus go back and fix it years later. It, 
really good thank you, a big thank you to our funders, uh, Health Canada, through the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer that has funded this work. Um, the Heart and Stroke Foundation as well provided support. And then um, I think we have other partners in the room that I would like to acknowledge, uh, the National Collaborating Centre for Healthy Public Policy and the National Collaborating Centre for Environmental Health, who have been project partners uh, within the context of our class initiative. Thank you.